Hey everyone, what's going on? Mr. Harvey here. Let's continue our lecture. We're on chapter five and we are talking about absolutism. Now in the previous lecture, I gave kind of just a general overview of absolutism. Uh, I talked about some of the uh, intellectual basis uh, and uh, justifications for absolutism, some of the characteristics of absolutism. Well, today I really wanna give an example and really discuss uh, the development of the best example of absolutism within uh, Western Europe French absolutism. Now, before I kind of do that, I want to give you a little context into French society, politically, socially, and economically, okay? And, uh, during the late 16th and early 17th century, and more into the, um, in, in part of the 18th century as well, all right? Something that's really important to understand about France, ladies and gentlemen, is it was divided into three classes, or three estates, okay? The first estate being the clergy, members of the church. The second estate, uh, the nobility, and the third estate, everybody else, anyone who is not either part of the nobility or the clergy. Now, what's important about this? You know, why are you saying, Harvey, why are we, we're talking about absolutism. Why do we need to know this? Well, I'm going to get there. All right. But what's important about this, ladies and gentlemen, is the first and second estates had all of the privilege. Really important for us to understand socially, politically, and economically. Okay. Uh, perhaps the most important privilege that the first and second estate had was that they did not pay any taxes. Let me repeat that. The first and second estate, the clergy and nobility, paid no taxes, little or no taxes in, uh, in France. Really important for us to understand. Now also, politically and socially, they held a lot of the privilege. They were in a lot of positions of power, whether it was in the, uh, you know, the court system, the judiciary, or whether it was in the military or the government. They had a lot of power, okay? Important for us to understand. Let's move on. Now, let's talk a little bit about the development of uh, French absolutism, and it really starts to take place with this uh, monarch that we know, Henry of Navarre or Henry IV. Now, let's kind of review Henry of Navarre a little bit. This is someone who's pretty important that we discussed uh, prior in Chapter 4, Wars of Religion, right? Henry of Navarre, the first Bourbon monarch, he, he comes out victorious in those French Wars of Religion. He was a Protestant, but he converts to Catholicism, right? Paris is worth a mass, very important for us. And he also really tries to settle things down in, um, in France with this Edict of Nantes, all right? Now, at the same time, he's also going to be, you know, really providing the foundation for French absolutism during this time. He's going to strengthen the government uh, institutions and, and the uh, monarch's control over these institutions, uh, the judiciary with the parliament, economically with the treasury, religiously with the French Catholic Church, but one of the most important things that Henry of Navarre does in order to consolidate power for the monarchy is to continue this drive of taking power away from the nobility. Now, how does he do that? Well, he's going to go after the traditional nobles of France called the nobles of the sword. This is the old nobility, the nobles of the sword. And what he's going to do, ladies and gentlemen, is he's going to create his own new class of nobles who are loyal to him and loyal to the monarchy. And those nobles are going to be the nobles of the sword. Now, y'all might be like, wait, he's just going to create new nobles? How does that help them? How does that help him? Well, what he's going to do is he's going to take people who are not nobles, who are not nobles, who might belong to the third estate and say, hey, do you want to become a noble? Would that person in the third estate say yes? Absolutely, because there's a lot, remember in the previous slide, there's a lot of privilege that comes with being part of the clergy or the nobility, the first and second estates. So what he's going to do is he's going to give people that privilege of being in the nobility in exchange for their loyalty. So he's going to create his own new class of nobles of the road. All right. And these are going to become high officials in the government. These are going to be officials in the military. They're going to be officials working within the economy, you know, uh, in the court system, but they are going to be super loyal to the monarchy because Henry gives them that title, that, that privilege of being part of the nobility. And this is a fundamental way of how Henry of Navarre is going to consolidate power and really lay down the foundations for absolutism in France. Really important for us, okay? Now, at the same time, we're also going to see the French monarchy gain greater and greater and greater control over the French economy, okay? We are going to see this Duke of Soli consolidate power for the monarchy and strengthen uh, the monarchy's control over French mercantilism, increase the role of the state within the economy, control the economy even more. And what's important about this is if the government has even more money, they can have a bigger army, they can have you know a bigger secret police, they can they can have more influence over um, 
the government. So we're going to see the king have more power with the Duke of Soli in the economy than ever before. And we're going to, you know, the king is going to have more control over trade. He's going to have more, is going to be accumulating more and more gold and silver that's going directly into the treasury for the government, right? And being able to, you know, kind of pick and choose what France is making, what France is not making, controlling manufacturing, really important. Now, he's, we're also going to see, you know, even more privilege going to the first and second estates with the tax code. Um, it, but the big idea here that I want you all to understand is that we are seeing th the monarchy, the government, have more control over the economy, and that equals more wealth for the monarchy. Okay, let's continue. All right, let's talk about Cardinal Richelieu. Cardinal Richelieu is really interesting. Now he's a politique who's going to further, you know, help, uh, you know, cement absolutism in France. Uh, but he's going to continue what Henry Navarre did in weakening and going after the nobility. And what he does is he goes after the nobility on a more local level. Let me discuss it. Okay. He institutes the intendant system. Let's make sure we highlight this. Make sure we circle this. We know this. Super important, ladies and gentlemen. Richelieu is going to replace all local officials, all local nobles of the swords, uh, all local civil servants who have who had been there traditionally for quite some time, and he's going to replace them with people who are loyal to the monarch. The, this might be uh, people in the third estate. This might be people. Uh, you know, uh, the new nobles of the robe, what he's doing is he is going to really, you know, uproot anybody who might give the monarch a problem on a local level and replace them with someone who's going to show absolute de uh, uh, devotion to the monarchy. Very important. Um, he's going to further uh, continue what that Duke of Soli did and further develop uh, mercantilism. All right. And also Richelieu is going to get France uh, involved in the Thirty Years' War, on purpose, in order to uh, not only help the uh, you know the monarchy uh, domestically, but on a foreign policy level to weaken the Habsburgs, to weaken the HRE, and you know really solidify France's dominance on the continent. As we know that the Thirty Years' War is going to be devastating to the Germanic lands, devastating to the Habsburg family. Okay, so this is Cardinal Richelieu. Now. Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Louis the Thirteenth. All right, not necessarily as important as Louis the Fourteenth, who we're about to talk about. All right, but Louis the Thirteenth. I just want to mention him just a little bit because he's going to uh, institute some minor changes uh, uh, from his father. Okay, he's going to inherit the throne at the age of nine. All right, and uh, he's going to work very closely with Richelieu. All right, and he and uh, Louis the Thirteenth is going to focus on strengthening, uh, extending royal power, strengthening the central government. But we're going to see um, Louis the Thirteenth really take a hardline approach towards the Huguenots, okay, and the nobles. All right, and these were two groups that threatened the power of the um, of the monarch. Um, but this is kind of different from you know what his father did. Remember, his father is really not, not necessarily going to try to destroy it, the uh, the nobility, but really just replace them. And also, his father really you know tried to create a peace settlement with the Huguenots after he converted. Um, from Protestantism. Um, so we see Louis the Thirteenth kind of going on a different path um, uh, from his father. Okay, and he also handpicked, ladies and gentlemen, Richelieu's successor, Cardinal Mazarin. Okay, but the monarch we have to know, the monarch we 100% have to know on the AP exam when it comes to absolutism, the best example of absolutism in this course, in this class, is Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King. Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King. Let's talk about him. All right, Louis the Fourteenth, ladies and gentlemen, is super important. He's the son of uh, Louis the Thirteenth. Okay, he is going to inherit the throne at the age of five. Unbelievable how young he is when he inherits the throne. Um, and he believed in divine right. He believed uh, that this right to rule came from God. We know that divine right. Okay, now. Louis the Fourteenth also took the sun as his symbol of absolute power. He 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 believed he kind of that was his symbol. That was his personification, um, and uh, he 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 believed you know that the sun really represented him because you know Louis thought that everything in France revolved around him. Well, we, as we know that during this time, with heliocentrism kind of uh, you know coming out into the fold in Europe, the uh, the, the idea that the, everything revolves around the sun. All right, so he was the Sun King, and you know this really kind of illustrates Louis's narcissism, 
uh, in his arrogance, but also really in, uh, illustrates the importance of science, okay, the importance in, in society. There, and we're going to be getting that in actually the next chapter and talk about the scientific revolution. But you can see the scientific revolution is here. The sun king, so the sun is a symbol. Very, very, very interesting uh, choice of, sim uh, of symbolism for, uh, for Louis XIV, okay? Now, during this time, ladies and gentlemen, the Estates General, and this is a medieval council, we're going to get to that a little bit later in the French Revolution, but the Estates General made, that made up all three, all three estates, okay, never met once during uh, uh, Louis' reign and, and, uh, and never was able to check his power. And really, th there's going to be no check on Louis XIV's power. He is going to rule uh, France with, uh, with absolute uh, power, okay? Let's talk a little bit about Louis when he was a child, okay? Now, Cardinal Mazarin is going to control France when Louis uh, was a child, okay? And during this time, when Louis was a kid, the nobles are going to revolt. This is going to be super, super, super uh, influential to Louis um, during his childhood. He is not going to forget this. And we are going to see, ladies and gentlemen, later on when he's older, he is going to really control the nobles and it's because he cannot trust them where does this distrust from the nobility come from when he was a child he does not like them he does not trust them okay and this comes from this fronde that is the that is the name of this uh rebellion um uh, of the nobles this the, uh that this fronde really is going to influence louis when he is um uh, uh, um when he's older okay and he's not going to forget this humiliation Okay, he's not going to forget this, and he's going to go after the nobles when he's older. Okay, let's talk a little bit about his policies. He's going to continue this intendant system, okay, uh, on a local level that uh, Richelieu really uh, put into place uh, during his tenure. Um, he's also going to cement his ties with the, uh, the middle classes and the new nobles, all right? And he's going to go after the nobles, check their power, check the power of the church, okay? He's going to recruit soldiers. He's going to really militarize France. Now... Uh, it, it's really important to understand that uh, Louis' foreign policy is, ac is actually going to be, uh, you know, something that really actually harms his reign. Um, but you know, during this time, he is going to really try to, uh, to uh, you know, make the French army, make the con this, the, uh, the French army the most dominant uh, army on the continent. Okay, and he's going to use the army to enforce his policies. All right, he's going to continue to use mercantilism to bolster the economy. Uh, one of his key advisors, and I want you to highlight this um, this uh, advisor's name is Jean Baptiste Colbert. All right, Colbert's goal during this time and during his tenure uh, was to make France self-sufficient, aka Colbert, under the uh, you know under the direction of Louis, wanted to make sure that France you know could survive on its own agriculturally when it came to raw materials. All right. Uh, make sure that France's economy was self-sufficient. They could sustain themselves. They didn't need another foreign power. They weren't reliant on a trade within England or Russia or Prussia or Spain. They could, they, they, they their economy could just run fine uh, themselves. Okay. Um, we're gonna see Colbert uh, really, um, uh, you know, clear out new lands for farming, encourage mining, uh, other basic industries. Okay. Uh, uh, imposed high tariffs on imported goods to protect. French manufacturers, oversaw the construction of roads and canals, okay, um, and during this time we're actually going to see a lot of peasants immigrate out of France because conditions are going to be so tough for them, all right. Now a couple of things that I want to discuss really quickly before I move on is the importance of tariffs, um, and if you all don't know, a tariff is a tax on a good, all right, um, that, that is coming from outside of a country. Um, so France, what 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 uh, Colbert is doing right here is he's really trying to make sure that people in France are buying French products. Okay, so for example, you know if it comes to wheat from England, he uh, Colbert is gonna you know put a tariff on that wheat. It might make it you know five dollars, whereas French wheat is three dollars. What are people in France gonna buy? They're gonna buy French wheat, right? Because the English wheat is too expensive, and this is just a way to protect uh, French indus uh, industry. We're gonna see. We'll talk a little bit more about economics uh, a little bit later in chapter eight, and it's, economics is going to be really important when we start getting into capitalism, socialism, and communism a little bit later. But this, but Colbert is going to really use mercantilism to cons uh, consolidate Louis's um, control over the economy and continue uh, what we've uh, seen prior. All right, um, this is really important, ladies and gentlemen. Is during Louis's tenure, the, the peasantry is going to you know have some really harsh conditions. Now, why is this important? Okay. For Louis, 
it's not going to have the biggest effect. But what I'm kind of getting at, ladies and gentlemen, is we are on our way to the French Revolution. Okay, I've introduced the estates a little bit and how the third estate really didn't have that many privileges and had to pay, you know, the bird, the tax burden and whatnot. This is going to be a big problem later on that's going to really, uh, you know, show up is the the harsh conditions for the peasantry. Okay, and Louis did not do a good job of helping the peasantry. And we will see later on, Louis the 16th, all right, this is gonna blow up, okay, and, and, and really be a, a big problem for him uh, during the French Revolution, okay? Now, something that's gonna be really, uh, that the peasantry is not gonna like and really illustrate this injustice of the peasantry is this idea of the corvée, okay? Um, the corvée was where the peasantry, and also members of the Third Estate, had forced labor, okay? They had to work a month out of the year on roads and other projects. That is that this is forced. This is they have to do this. They have to work for a month. So what this means is, and they have to do this for free. All right, they they, they don't you know get to you know provide for their own families. They don't get to you know do their own jobs or whatever. They have to do this. All right, this is essentially they have to be slaves for you know one month out of the year. All right, this is something that illustrates that really big class difference from the first, second, and third estates, all right? This is something that the third estate has to do, and this is typically relegated to the peasantry. They're not gonna like this. We'll see this uh, this problem show up a little bit later in the French Revolution, okay? Now, I wanna talk about the Palace of Versailles, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Louis the Fourteenth is going to build Versailles, and he will spare no expense at making this one of the most magnificent buildings in Europe. And ladies and gentlemen, it is absolutely incredible. During my class, we're gonna take a look at Google uh, Maps. Um, when we are going to take a tour of Versailles, it is incredible, okay? And Louis made it like that. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a symbol of his wealth and power, saying, hey, welcome to my place. And it is just spectacular. Now, um, this is an example, ladies and gentlemen, of Baroque art. We, we talked a little about Baroque art in, uh, earlier this year, showcasing the power of Catholic Church in the face of the Counter-Reformation. Well, this is Baroque art sh uh, showcasing the power of the monarchy. Okay, um, and this uh, Versailles will serve as Louis's home and the seat of the government. Okay, so like I said before, this utilized Baroque architectural uh, techniques. It was dramatic. It was overwhelming. People were just like, <gasps> when they saw Versailles, it was spectacular and it still is today. Okay, it was built uh, on the outskirts of Paris. Okay, um, and so this kind of becomes the new seat of the government. All right, during this time, ladies and gentlemen, the royal court is going to grow from 600 people to 10,000. Okay, and most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, this was a way that Louis was able to control the nobles. He is going to have thousands of nobles live at Versailles, and he is going to make them live at Versailles. And this is a place where he can watch them and control them, okay? He is going to keep his enemies, anybody who might threaten his power, very close to him, okay? So he can watch them, okay? And you betcha he had his government watching them. There were all kinds of eyes and ears on the nobles in Versailles, and that was Louis watching them, making sure that they th uh, have no threat to his power, okay? And so he required the nobles to uh, live, you know, at the palace at least for a few months out of the year, and then they could, you know, go off to live at their own homes or whatnot, but they were required. And that illustrates that power. Louis has the power to make nobles live where he wants them to live, all right? So that just illustrates Louis's power. Now, Versailles, ladies and gentlemen, cost one half of France's annual revenue every single year to just maintain, all right? And we are going to see, ladies and gentlemen, that um, the French monarchy is going to really mismanage its funds, really have some economic problems, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, especially uh, when we see the debt that they accumulate with the Seven Years' War with the American Revolution and how that debt is really going to play a big part in the French Revolution that is coming. Okay, um, now something that's really interesting, I just want to give you all a little example that illustrates the power of Louis is this uh, ritual called uh, the Levy. All right, or the rising. And this began uh, each day in the king's bedroom, okay, where high-ranking nobles competed for the honor of holding uh, the royal washman or to hand the king his shoes. And this just illustrates, 
Louis's control over the nobles. I mean, you would have nobles in Versailles fighting just to make eye contact with Louis, just to, you know, just to be able to see Louis, all right? That illustrates really, ladies and gentlemen, the centralization of power and how far the nobles in France, the nobles in the West have really fallen since the feudal times where power was very decentralized. This illustrates Louis's power, Louis's control over the nobility. Okay, and that and the, the, the control of the monarchy over France. All right, Louis has absolute control, all right, and absolute control over the closest competitors in power, which were the nobles. All right, let's talk about uh, a little bit about Louis's religious policies and some of his foreign policy, and then we'll stop the lecture for today, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, now Louis considered himself the head of the French Catholic Church, also the Gallican Church. Okay, and he maintained Gallican liberties, aka no papal influence on the French church, okay? France is still Catholic, but Louis is very much in control of religious matters when it comes to France, all right? Now, he is also going to take a very hard line approach towards Protestants. He is going to revoke the Edict of Nantes with the Edict of Fontainebleau, all right? And he is going to take away uh, the Huguenots' rights, specifically their right to practice Calvinism, okay? And many Huguenots will be leaving France and immigrate um, immigrate from France. They will be immigrating to the New World. They'll be immigrating to places where they're accepted, like the Netherlands. They'll be, you know, they will be immigrating to other places where they are accepted, okay? Also, we are going to see, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, Louis support the Jesuits in persecuting other religious groups, the Jansenists. And the, the Jansenists were uh, a group that believed humans could not achieve their own salvation. But what's important to see, ladies and gentlemen, is Louis is going to take a very hard line approach on other religious minorities and really uh, consolidate Catholic control, uh, Catholicism within France and uh, the control, his control over um, religious matters in France. Okay, let's continue. All right, let's talk about his foreign wars, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, uh, Louis is going to be involved in quite a number of uh, foreign conflicts. Okay, and he didn't necessarily want to conquer Europe. He wanted to secure his international borders. Okay, and we're going to we're really going to I'm going to talk about a couple wars, but um, there's one war that I really want to uh, that I really want to uh, focus on, which I'll get to. Okay, now he's going to get in uh, a couple wars with the Netherlands. Okay, he's going to invade. Uh, the Spanish Netherlands, okay, he's going to uh, 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 get in this War of Devolution, the Second Dutch War, uh, and where he simply is going to, you know, kind of go back and forth with territory, trade territory, accumulate a little bit of territory, okay. Um, he's going to be in this War of the League of Augsburg, okay, um, and but the big war that I want us to really focus on, ladies and gentlemen, is the War of Spanish Succession, okay. This is the war that I really want people to take detailed notes on, highlight, all right, and let's pay attention. All right, this war of Spanish succession was from 1701 to 1714, okay? And we are going to see, ladies and gentlemen, a threat to the balance of power within Europe, okay? Charles II, he is the last Spanish Habsburg king. He is going to die, and there is no heir. And this, ladies and gentlemen, uh, left the kingdom to Louis XIV's grandson, who's going to become known as Philip V. Now, this terrified Europe because... Of the possibility of having a unified France and Spain. So we are going to see Europe kind of, you know, get into action to keep the balance of power. And I'm going to talk about this concept of the balance of power a little bit later on, but this is important because Europe is going to kind of, it, we're going to see European countries, you know, get involved in into some major conflicts in order to make sure that one country doesn't become too large or one country doesn't you know, have too much power, okay? And so we're going to see Europe be quite terrified at the possibility of having a united uh, France and Spain. Now, fast forward, France is not going to win this war, and we're going to see the Treaty of Utrecht, okay? Um, and it's actually a series of treaties from 1713 uh, to uh, 1715. So I kind of just put the uh, the War of Spain succession to right here in the middle. Just understand that the war, and the war is in the early 1700s, okay? But this treaty is important for us to understand. So let's uh, so let's talk about it, okay. There's gonna it's gonna maintain the, the balance of power in Europe, but it's gonna change our map a little bit, okay. And we're gonna see some significant changes. Uh, obviously, one of them is we're gonna see the the, uh, the ending of the expansion of Louis the Fourteenth, but we're gonna see Spain be really hit hard from this treaty. Spanish possessions in Europe are gonna be divided. 
uh, King Philip will be allowed to remain uh, the king, but the England, uh, but England is going to take some territory from uh, from Spain that they still have today. For example, Gibraltar. All right, we're going to see the Spanish Netherlands. Uh, we're going to see the Spanish lose the Spanish Netherlands, modern day Belgium. Okay, that's going to be given to Austria. All right, um, so we see some really significant changes. Okay, um, uh, note how Spain. This is kind of, you know, Spain taking yet another L, all right? Spain is going to lose a lot of territory from this, okay? But Philip is allowed to remain king, all right? Now, Louis' wars are going to have a drastic effect on Spain. And France, or excuse me, Louis' wars are going to have a dramatic, dramatic effect on uh, France. Um, France is not going to be able to recover from this, ladies and gentlemen, okay? It's going to ruin, Louis' wars ruin the French economy. And this is really important for us, ladies and gentlemen, because the French economy is going to be a big problem, okay? And it's this is really foreshadowing, um, ladies and gentlemen, our uh, French Revolution, okay? Ruin the French economy, okay? 20% of the French uh, subjects are, are gonna die, and there is a lot of debt now in the government. And the problem is, is that France has a ton of wealth, but they can't tap into it because the first estate and the second estates, the clergy and the nobility, don't pay taxes. So. There's a huge debt for, you know, the third estate and the peasantry and, you know, the peasantry, there's only so much money they can pay until they, you know, they don't have anything. Um, and we're going to see, we're going to see this issue of, of taxation, of debt, uh, you know, come back to haunt the French and we'll, we'll be getting to that um, later on in some other chapters. Okay. All right. That is it for today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. All right. And uh, in the next lecture, we're going to be talking about Eastern Europe. Okay. Thank you so much.